Gotcha. Hello everyone, and welcome to my complete monster guide for fighting Shara Ishvalda, also known as the Everworm. Shara Ishvalda is definitely one of the more difficult fights in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. It's a longer fight because it has three distinct stages. First when he's covered in rocks, then when the rocks come off he's naked, and then finally when he pops his creepy eyes open and he starts using much more powerful attacks. Now my goal is to give you tips for all three of these stages, as well as to talk about his most dangerous moves, the moves that are most likely going to get you killed. If you learned something new from this guide, don't forget to leave a like on it or even consider sharing it. Let's start the guide out by taking a quick look at the Hunter's Notes. So the Hunter's Notes are always very vague. They don't give you uh, descriptive numbers on his own values, but we can still gleam some information from them, right? Let's take a look at the elements. You'll notice right away, he's very weak to ice. He's immune to thunder. All right, so if you're going to bring an elemental type, bring ice, avoid thunder. For ailments, he's surprisingly weak in the first stage to blast. You can see he has a three-star weakness to blast. He only has a one-star weakness to stun. Keep that in mind. He can't be put to sleep, but he can be poisoned. Okay? Let's take a look at those hit zone values. Capcom is calling them weak points, of course, and it doesn't really reveal the true numbers behind it, but check it out. Something really surprised me. In his rock form, the head is actually not the best place to be attacking with the greatsword and with the hammer. Right when he would go down or when I'm attacking him, I would just go straight for the head. His back is actually the best place for Severin Blunt. Check it out. That's where they get three stars. So I don't really know how it works out because all I can think of is you could clutch claw up there. More importantly, though, when he gets knocked over and he usually gets knocked over once or twice, when he gets knocked over, don't run to the head, run to his back. OK, a shot damage is a little easier. Shot damage does get three stars on the head. So just aim for the head all the time. And then for all the weapons, just ignore the tail, the legs, and the wings, and, you know, kind of his butt area. You just won't get good damage in those areas. When we jump over to naked Shara Ishvalda, nothing changes for the elements. The ailments does lose a level of blast, so he's a little more resistant to blast now. And then the hit zones actually do change. Now you'll want to go after his head with Sever and Blunt. This is probably the least safe place to be when you're fighting him as well is to focus on his head because a lot of his moves are going to be head concentrated whereas his butt is actually the safest place to fight him but you don't do very good damage on it uh, you could always go for his underbelly everything gets two stars on his underbelly the underbelly is fairly safe as well i'd argue and then shot type damage gets three star weakness on the wings however you can't soften the wings so it's better in my opinion to focus on his head and his underbelly with your shot type damage of course, for farming Shara Ishvalda, if you want better rewards, you need to break his head twice. So everyone should be bringing Part Breaker, and then everyone should be focusing on his head with Part Breaker. And this is very easy to do, because in stage one of the fight, when he's covered in rock, you're going to be bringing Part Breaker anyways in order to shed those rocks off. Right, you need to Part Break all the rocks off of him as fast as you can. You just keep your Part Breaker on your build, go for the head, everyone goes for the head, and then the head breaks twice, and then you get two more carves, and those carves are almost always... Uh, the valuable carves. The head carve is going to give you a Shara Ishval, the tender plate, which you need, or a Shara Ishval, the gem, which has a very low drop rate. So if you've already finished the story fight against Shara Ishvalda, and now you're back because you're trying to grind him up for some parts, which is understandable. A lot of the Shara Ishvalda weapons are extremely good post-story weapons to be building. You want to be sure that you're breaking his head, focusing all your damage on his head. It's very hard to break his head twice. Almost all your damage has to go to the head. Keep in mind, as soon as that headpiece breaks, if you're not confident in your team, look for an opening to run over and carve it, because once again, it's, it's kind of giving you the bottleneck materials that you need in order to craft Shar Ishvalda's weapons and armor, you know, Shar Ishvalda gem and Shar Ishvalda tender plate. So if you can get that carve in, even if you were to lose the fight later, you still probably got valuable materials out of that fight that was worth your time. All right, let's move on to talking about combat with the rock-covered Shara Ishvalda. Be sure when you land in camp to look on your right-hand side for some free torch pods. These torch pods can be used as a way to get a flinch shot on Shara Ishvalda, right? And then when you jump down into the arena, you want to look specifically for the rock that looks kind of like this. This is a rock that's going to cause a boulder to fall on top of Shara Ishvalda. What I would do is immediately soften up his hide on his face, and then turn them right into that boulder using your torch paws and just throw them right into the boulder and start going crazy on them. 
I believe, can you do this twice? I believe you can do this twice. I don't know if you can do it three times though. You can do it at least twice, dropping those boulders. So you can drop those on him. They're gonna do massive damage. They're gonna quickly speed up that whole fight because not only did the boulder do damage, but you're going to be doing damage to him too while he's knocked down. He's knocked down for a fairly long period of time. Anytime Shara Ishvalda is no longer softened up, you need to stop what you're doing and immediately soften his hide once again so that you're getting the best damage you can get on his head. And once again, make sure you're kind of following those hit zone values correctly. When he's knocked down, you want to go for his back using the uh, great sword, using the hammer, you know, sever and blunt, and then shot type damage, just go straight for his head. Of course, if you're just trying to play safe, you probably stay right under his belly and shoot his underbelly. All of Shara Ishvalda's moves in stage one are highly telegraphed. They have fairly good range, but they're very slow and they have fairly good damage as well. The trick is to not get impatient. Okay, especially if you had to fight this guy three times in a row because maybe you fainted the first two times, right? You lost those missions. The third time you're gonna go in and you're gonna start to feel impatient. You're gonna be like, ah, geez, I gotta fight this stage one part of the fight again. And that's when you start to get clumsy too, okay? So what I highly recommend, make sure that you're not losing any lives on stage one so that in stage two and stage three, you have all your lives, you know? Do everything correctly in stage one, don't get impatient. That's the whole trick to, to stage one is he baits you into being impatient. Now, in my opinion, the two most dangerous attacks in stage one, the first one's going to be when he's kind of like plowing the field. He puts his hands down, you know, his big old wings down on the ground, and then he just kind of scrapes forward like he's plowing. And it's very easy to get caught in this because it has a ton of range. No, you cannot just walk between the fingers. And no, you can't really roll through them either because you'll get hit by his body behind the wings, okay? So his body counts as the hitbox as well. Your best move is to guard it, dive evade it, or try to run around it, okay? One of those three, it's gonna work the best. For the other very dangerous move, he's going to stand on his hind legs, put his hands up in the air. It's gonna stand there for a while, and then he's gonna slap those big old hands down and if you got touched by them, you took a ton of damage. This is an easy two-shotting move. So if you're already missing some of your health, it's going to two-shot you. It's going to get you, basically, it's going to one-shot you from your remaining health. So just be very careful. If you see this move, it gives you plenty of time to get out of the way of it. But if you misinterpret it as maybe like a roar, or you're like, oh, yeah, I'm out of the range because you think you're far enough back, but you're not really far enough back, you're going to get destroyed by this move. Make sure make sure you run like behind him or just get far away from this, okay? Once his hands come down, there's plenty of time to punish him, so there's really no excuse for being in the range of this particular move. Let's pretend that you are done with stage one and you're moving on to stage two. We're in stage two of the guide. Shara Ishvala has finished coming out of his rock shell and now you can see his nasty little fingers and he's going to shoot you with bursts of air. So what are the tricks for getting through stages two and three of the fights? I really hope you'll continue to watch this part because I feel like the best tips are actually in stage three. And that's because it's the most difficult part of the fight as well. So of course, the best tips are gonna show up there. When stage two begins, you wanna make sure that you do have pods in your slinger. This is gonna be used for a flint shot. You're going to be using flint shot to throw him into the wall. And just like in stage one, you're going to be able to throw him into the wall and get boulders to fall on him for huge damage and a free knockdown. Now, the trick, though, is that Shara Ishvalda is able to knock these boulders down on his own and essentially ruin them for you. So he can shoot the big old beam, right, where he puts all his fingers together. Or he can shoot the little beams in a big sweeping motion where he pushes them out or pulls them in. Or he can do the little static beams like it's mission impossible you're tom cruise not trying not to touch any of the lines well if he hits the wall where a falling boulder would be that falling boulder is going to go ahead and fall over and you're going to miss out on the opportunity to flinch shot him into that falling boulder see the problem so try to get this done early so that he doesn't knock all these boulders down and you miss out on the opportunity on that high free damage and that awesome knockdown it's really nice to have that knockdown now, one of the main things I wanted to help you with in this video is dealing with the large beam. Okay, he puts all his fingertips together, he shoots a big old beam in front of him, and if you were latched onto his head because maybe you're using clutch claw, you immediately get sucked into the beam. Now, this is not a big deal if you had full health, it's just gonna deal, you know, a bit of damage to you and send you flying. But if you were wearing the rock steady mantle, you just got eviscerated. Okay, so one of the main things you have to be careful not to do in this fight is to think that just because you're wearing Rocksteady, 
you're going to be safe clutch clawing onto his head. Rocksteady Mantle is a nice way to get clutch claw attacks on monsters where they can't interrupt you because you've got the Rocksteady on, right? So I abuse this all the time. But with the Shara Ishvalda fight, he abuses you when you're wearing Rocksteady. So if you grab onto his head while wearing Rocksteady and he goes into the big old beam, that's going to hit you multiple times before you can even react. It's basically guaranteed death if you grabbed his head at the wrong time while wearing Rocksteady. So be careful how you think of Rocksteady. You can even take it off if you think that would be safer. Like, just don't even have it in your gear. Oh, fuck. One of the mantles you can replace Rocksteady with is actually the Glider Mantle. Of all mantles, the Glider Mantle. Uh, why am I saying this? This is because you can actually use this tech where you grab onto the side of Shara Ishvalda using a clutch claw, and then on the Xbox controller, you hit A to jump down. This is going to be an X on the PlayStation controller. So you jump down, and when you do this, Glider Mantle actually goes into a float, and you can turn this into an aerial attack. This effectively allows you to mount Shara Ishvalda uh, where you couldn't do that before. I mean, you could do it if you had Insect Glaive, if you had Sword and Shield, if you had Lance, and that's because those weapons have built-in aerial attacks, and they can use that to build mount damage. But if you're using like a hammer or a greatsword, you can bring that uh, Glider Mantle to get those aerial attacks done, and then you can get at least one mount. I wouldn't go for a second mount. I would say that would be an inefficient use of your time, but at least one mount. And the mounting minigame against Shara Ishvalda is especially tricky. You're gonna be holding right trigger a lot because a lot of his moves, it's not like you can just move from one part of his body to another part of his body in order to avoid the stamina cost or the stamina damage. You actually have to grip onto him. So uh, the first time you try this, there's a very good chance you'll actually fail the mounting minigame. Again, the safest way to win it is to just uh, grab onto him, right trigger all of his moves, okay? So uh, if you learned something new there, once again, don't forget to leave a like maybe. Don't forget to maybe share, leave a comment. Let me know if you, A, didn't know that you could use that tech with the glider mantle to get an aerial attack out, or B, maybe you didn't know that Shara Ishvala was even mountable. Yeah, pretty strange stuff, huh? Shara Ishvalda obviously is very similar in size and shape to Zenajiva, so we weren't allowed to actually mount Zenajiva, and that's why it feels like you're not supposed to be able to mount Shara Ishvalda, but yeah, he's totally mountable. But you might be saving that mount for stage 3 of the fight, and that's because in stage 3 of the fight, as we all know, things really get crazy and hectic with the ground turning to sand pits, right? Well, the mount, if you use it in stage 3, just makes more sense because you're crowd controlling him in the most difficult part of the fight. Similar to the paralysis, so you can get one paralysis off on him. So if you're playing a bow gun, you might have paralysis ammo. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using a paralysis weapon against him, honestly. If you were going to fight him with the elemental type, I would use ice and just get more damage. But if you're using maybe a bow or a bow gun, very often you have access to paralysis ammo. Well, you just shoot him with the paralysis ammo, you're gonna get that paralyze off. But again, do it in stage three because that's when he's most dangerous. So you don't wanna waste those in stage two when he's a little more easy, see what I'm saying? Same with the poison smoke bombs. So just like Zenajiva, Shara Ishvalda can be poisoned using poison smoke bombs and he's taking 80 damage per tick from that. So it's quite a bit of poison damage. You can save those for stage three to make sure that you're getting a little extra damage on him in the most difficult stage of the fight. If you do it in stage two, it's gonna be very difficult to proc poison a second time on him, unless maybe you're using poison weapons like gold Raytheon weapons, for example. But let's say you're not using gold Raytheon weapons. Save those poison smoke bombs for stage three of the fight. It, again, this is gonna help you kind of skip ahead in the fight a bit. So poison smoke bomb, mount, paralysis, right? KO, you, you might end up KOing him early in stage two. I don't think that's as big of a deal because you might end up getting two KOs in the entirety of the stage two, stage three fight. That's just how it's going to be, especially if you're using a hammer. You can't really avoid it. You're just gonna end up KOing whenever you KO, but the other ones you can control a little more. By the way, I did want to give this tip out again to players who are defeating Shara Ishvala for the first time. If you're not familiar with any of his moveset and you're not ready to deal with any of his moves, just grab onto his hind legs, soften them up, and just focus exclusively on them with no exception. If you just focus exclusively on the hind legs, you will get through the entire fight, both the stages two and stages three. It's the safest part of his body, and none of his attacks actually go there. Uh, he can occasionally like shoot one beam behind himself, that's about it. He doesn't really do anything else. Also, grabbing onto his hips, his, you know, his hind legs, every time he's about to pivot or turn toward you, you'll discover he's not able to turn because you're attached to him and turning with him. If you're playing by yourself, 
Don't forget to bring the Fortitude skill. The Fortitude skill can proc twice, giving you a huge bonus to attack and defense. This is a skill I talk about all the time, so you've probably already heard about it, but if you haven't, I'm telling you right now, always have Fortitude on your solo play builds, especially if you're struggling, because every time you die, you get this huge boost to your defense. Uh, also, if you're playing solo, give your Palico a paralysis weapon. So let's say you're playing by yourself with the hammer, you should be using an elementless raw damage hammer probably, and you can give your Palico a status weapon, a paralysis status weapon, and this is going to allow your Palico to give you that one paralysis against Shara Ishvalda. Now, Shara Ishvalda in stage two, he has a lot of new moves that he did not have in his rock form. Let's talk about a few of them in particular, the ones that I feel are especially punishable and the ones that I feel are especially dangerous. We already talked about the wide beam. Oh, fuck. The wide beam's not so complicated, actually. Just stay on the outside of the beam near his hands, his big wings, and as soon as the beam is gone, run straight up to the head and attack it, okay? You get an easy punish every time he uses this. If you were behind him when he uses this, be sure you keep up with the hands because he's gonna be knocked backwards and you run the risk of being sucked into the beam anyways. You just back up with it and you can very easily punish his head at that point as well. So the large beam is actually highly punishable. Uh, his other moves that I've mentioned already, he's got the ones where he, he kind of shoots down a, a, a straight curtain of wind and he'll push this forward. He'll spread his fingers out to push it forward or he'll do the opposite. He'll shoot that curtain of wind ahead of himself and then he'll pull it in. So it kind of creates a moving wall of damage in each case. You can technically sneak between the, the bars of this wall, but it's much safer not to do that. It's much safer to simply outspace it. So, you know, if he's pulling it in as he gets closer with that move, run to his hind legs. If he's pushing it out, you're gonna have to run around it if you weren't already behind it. If you were behind it, easy punish. One of the very easiest to punish moves is when Shara Ishvalda lunges forward as if to bite you, right? He just kind of leans down and chomps. Very easy to punish, but be careful because most of his body, the front of his body is actually a hitbox when he's using that. Another very easy to punish move is when he fires those wind beams in a static pattern, but they just sit there and he kind of gets on his hind legs when he does this. Well, the trick is to just kind of get into a safe place and not move and then wait for him to end it, he'll actually fall back down, he'll fall forward, and this is also a very easy punish on his head. Shara will also occasionally fire a single beam of air at you. This is aimed very well, and the trick is to constantly be moving, because if you were moving when he aimed this at you, it will miss. However, let's say you were attached to his head because of Clutch Claw, he'll actually shoot you off of his head with Clutch Claw, then you're in a really bad position because he's he's going to set up his next move and you're already missing a chunk of health. And then Ishvalda has a series of very basic melee attacks, right? Like he'll swing with his claw, he'll swipe a claw under his belly, he'll actually use his foreleg in one of his attacks, one of his harder to avoid moves. He'll set one of the claws down and then he'll kind of plow forward like he did when he was covered in rocks. He doesn't do it with both wings, but he'll do it with one. So he's got a lot of easy to understand, fairly slow moving melee attacks that you can learn just from playing against him multiple times. But now you've knocked him into stage three and boy, it's time to suffer. Stage three of the fight is probably where you and your teammates are most likely going to die. And in my opinion, the reason you're going to die is because of the sand. It's time to die to sand. Shara Ishvalda is going to let you know that he's going into stage three because he's going to take his nasty little wing fingertips. He's going to poke them into the ground and he's presumably shooting air into the ground and turning the rock into sand. And this is what's causing all of the sand in the playing field. And this is really where things get difficult because once you walk into that sand, you really slow down. The sand is pairing very well with his moveset. So up to this point, the, the trick to dealing with Shara has been pretty much outspacing his moves and then running in for a punish. Well, with all of this quicksand in the arena, can't really do that anymore, right? So if you try to outspace a move, what you might end up doing is walking into a sand pit. If you're trying to run in and punish him, you're probably gonna be stopped by a sand pit. And then even more dangerously, the sand pit explodes as if you needed it to be more difficult. So the sand pit is exploding when he initially creates the sand pits, but also anytime those sand pits are touched by one of his moves. So if he uses one of his air attacks, like the big beam or his fingertips, and or he roars even, I think the roar will even trigger it. 
uh, and the sand that's nearby him, this is going to cause an explosion in that sand for fairly high damage. If you're wearing rock steady while you're in the sand, this can proc multiple times on your rock steady and kill you very fast. Uh, if you're guarding in the sand, this can knock you back multiple times and leave you with very little stamina, depending on how much guard you have. So the sand becomes a really difficult environmental hazard in stage three, but fear not, there's a very effective way of dealing with this. I've done my research and I'm here to teach it to you. Basically, if you didn't already know, the skill Mire Walker is allowing you to move at normal speed in the sand. The reason the sand is difficult is because it slows you down considerably. Mire Walker speeds you back up. Now, the trick that you probably didn't know is that other than using the Mire Walker skill, which might require certain pieces of armor or it might require decorations that you don't have, you can actually eat for Mire Walker. There's the new preparation feline food skills, and one of them is called feline cleats. You'll see that it reads, allows for normal movement speed, even in special terrain. This is basically Mire Walker that you can eat. You only need two of those ingredients in order to activate it. You can use a gourmet voucher or a regular voucher in order to ensure that you get it. And yeah, this is going to allow you to have all the benefits of Mire Walker without having to put it into your build. This is especially useful if you don't have the decoration. Now, if you do have the decorations, probably you just put that into your build. The reason I say that is because it's not really that expensive of a skill, although you might be struggling at this point if you're trying to build both Mire Walker and Part Breaker. I can understand that, but there's also risks to only having it as a feline food skill. There's two things I would mention. First of all, if you were to faint, then you would lose the benefit of feline cleats. And then the other thing I'd have to say is there's this really good skill to eat now called feline safeguard. Feline safeguard is feline insurance. They're the same thing, except you can always eat feline safeguard. So with feline insurance, you kind of have to get lucky. It has to become available, right? It's one of the daily skills, it's random. But feline safeguard is always available. So if you're really struggling against this guy, you would want to build uh, Mire Walker into your setup, and then you would want to eat for feline safeguard. If you don't have enough Mire Walker decorations, don't forget you can just build the Mire Walker charm. Okay, so that's probably one of the best pieces of advice I can give you for stage three of the fight is to just have Meyer Walker, maybe the, simply the canteen meal, right? Now, Shar Ishfald is going to have several new moves for stage three of the fight. We already talked about him creating sand. Well, I wanted to mention that he has a move where he places his fingertips into the ground. Of course, he's creating sand like he normally does, and, but this sand is interesting because it'll actually show up underneath you no matter where you're at. So even if you got far away from him and tried to sharpen, the sand will pop up underneath you. So just be wary when he puts his fingertips into the ground no matter where you're at. He also likes to scoop players with both of his hands now right in front of him. That's his new melee attack. Most notably, Shar Ishfalda picks up a supernova. All right, so it's a huge supernova. He creates like a giant orb of air, and then he throws it down in the center of the stage, and it explodes. You definitely can't block it. I tested it. <laughs> you can see me dying here to test it, just for you. Uh, there is a way to avoid it while staying in the map. Simply run to the edge of the map. I've seen people say, get behind him. I've seen people get say, get to the opposite side of him. You just gotta be on the edge of the map. And this can be tricky to do because you can get tremored or you can get stuck in the sand and then you don't make it in time. Well, the very, very, very safest thing for you to do is to simply far cast out. You remember far casters. Far casters are those consumables that take you directly to camp even in the middle of combat. After you've used your far caster, don't forget to go back and get a fresh far caster. That is a mistake I've made before. You use your first far caster and you forget to grab a second one. All right, and that's going to be the end of the guide. That's everything I have to share with you. If you have something that you would like to share that I didn't cover in the guide, feel free to mention it in the comment section and maybe you'll get upvoted. The other thing I'll mention is I do have a pretty active Monster Hunter World Discord server. A link to it is in the description. Basically, you join there and you can talk to people live and you, know, you can find somebody to play with you. I, I only mention this because I know later on in the game's life cycle, there won't be as much activity around the story, so you might have trouble finding decent SOS teammates. So if you're in this situation in the future, come ask for help. All right, I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.